Come on, can you put your hands together for the Lord tonight? Yeah! Wow, happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. I think, I think school is back in session for most everybody at this point. Uh, I know like haze and dripping started last week. AISD started this week. Traffic is back. Why? It is the worst. Like, and people are still crazy. They, they still drive crazy. You still drive crazy. <laughs> Not me, you. And I will do my best tonight. I, I want to honor the fact that uh, I know your kids have school tomorrow and you are in the house tonight. And so I, I will do my best to not be lengthy, but I'm only making that promise for the first couple of weeks because that's when you really care. And then after like the second week, you're like, oh, they'll be fine. They'll be okay. Anybody, you're like, yeah, they're going to be fine. Just, just go to bed. We'll wake up. I don't care if you're tired. Just don't be rude. And you'll survive school tomorrow. You'll be okay. So I'll, I'll try to be short the next couple of weeks, but then after that, no promises. Um, but I'm excited about where we're going tonight. If you've been with us in our midweeks, um, when I've been speaking, I've been working through the book of First Samuel, and I've just, you may not have been having fun with it, but I've been really enjoying just diving in and just really going chapter by chapter and just see what the Lord has for us. And tonight is absolutely no different. We are in chapter 17 this evening, but let me if you've missed some time, let me just recap kind of where we've been very quickly. I won't belabor the point by any means, but let's remember back to chapter 16. We see the Lord directing Samuel, the prophet, the, the man of God for the hour to go to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king of Israel. Samuel goes and Jesse marches all of his sons out and Samuel Samuel says, is this, is this all you got? Because obviously it wasn't who the Lord had, had called. And Jesse says, well, I mean, I got one more, but he's on the backside of a mountain tending some sheep. And Samuel says, go get that young man. In fact, he says, we're not sitting down until he comes in here. And so you know the story. David would be the young man who was on the backside of, of a mountain tending some sheep. And the Lord, through the prophet Samuel, would anoint David as the next king of Israel. And it's amazing how his story unfolds. But as some time would pass, King Saul has now had his, the hand of God removed from his life because of the way that he's dealing with the Lord and the way that he's leading the people. The Lord is no longer with him. And so the hand of the Lord is off of him, which means he's open to these attacks from spirits. And the Bible says that he, he was attacked by spirits and, and he needed he felt like if he could find somebody that could play this instrument, that it would just bring him peace. And so he, he tells all of his attendants, he says, listen, I need you to find the best person who can play the instrument the best and bring him to me. And out of the, the people that were around the king at the moment, wouldn't you know, isn't it amazing how God works that of the people that heard and of the person that piped up, he just happened to know one young boy who knew how to play the instrument that Saul was looking for, and that young man happened to be David. Is this coincidence? I think not. We said it was a setup. God was setting David up and preparing him for what was to come, and, and, and Saul, for the time being at least, enjoyed David's, David's presence, and he actually told his dad, he told Jesse, he said, listen, I want, I want David to stay with me in, in the palace. I want to bring him here. Coincidence? No, 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 no. God was setting him up and preparing him. He would be anointed king, but he, he is not ready to wear the crown of the king at this point. There would be many years that would pass before he would actually sit on the throne, and so our story progresses as we see David anointed as king, David set up and prepared for his future 
God was at work when nobody knew God was working. I don't even think David knew God was working. But God was moving and working and putting all of these pieces of the puzzle together. He was setting him up. And tonight as we move into chapter 17, a very familiar passage of scripture, everyone in this room will know what happens in this chapter. I'm simply calling the message tonight a servant and a stone. A servant and a stone. It's the story of probably the most well-known mano e mano man versus man fight in the word of God. David versus Goliath. And we have preached, we as in like preachers all across the world have preached this story a billion times. You have heard every angle of David and Goliath. I don't, I don't think there's a, a, an angle on this story that I could preach tonight that you probably would say, I've never heard that. So what I just felt like in my spirit to do, I, as I was studying this, this chapter some months ago, to be honest with you, I, and I wasn't even prepared to preach a message on this. I just was, was just writing down some things that the Lord brought to my attention in this passage. And so I just want to share with you through this story several things that jumped out at me about David and things that, that impressed me about David in this chapter. And so let, let's walk through chapter 17 tonight, and this is, this is a fun chapter. This is an exciting chapter. This is a, a sitting on the edge of your seat kind of story tonight. So if, you're about, if you see somebody next to you and they're falling asleep, You know what I did as a student pastor one time? Y'all, I gotta tell you, this has nothing to do with anything. I'm so sorry. I told you I was gonna let you out early. I've already lied because this story's gonna get me off track. This was many, many years ago. Our youth group was small at the time and this kid fell asleep. I mean, out. I mean, just not even like, I'm talking like just, and I get it. I mean, I, I understand. It's been a long day. stand up and walk out of the room. We tried to get every student to get out of the room and see how long it would take. He actually busted it. It didn't go as well as we thought. We made too much noise trying to get out of the room. See, y'all look at, a, you look at your pastor and you think, man, he's got it. I do not have it all together. God is still working on me. <laughs> so if you fall asleep tonight... And you wake up and ain't nobody here. Maybe it's the rapture or maybe we're playing a joke on you. I don't know. <laughs> so chapter 17 starts with the preparation of a war, the Philistines versus the Israelites. We'll start with verse three. We'll read quite a bit of scripture tonight. So if you don't like the Bible, you can leave now. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. I like, I like, ooh, a champion named Goliath. He was a champion, which means he had done this before. You don't get called champion if you're not good at what you do. He's a champion. He'd won some battles before, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. Can you picture this? You got you to you allow your mind to go there. His spear was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? And he says this, I, he just, ooh, he's arrogant. How many of you know a champion that's arrogant? Mm -hmm. He says, choose a man and have him come down to me. And if he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. 
But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and you will serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Again, catch this verbiage. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Don't fight me, y'all. Don't you come at me. Got you. On hearing the Philistine's word, please don't fight me. Please. (laughs) On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites, Saul and everyone in his army, Saul the king and all of his warriors who were trained in battle were dismayed and they were terrified. The Bible would continue to describe in the next few verses and tell us that David's oldest three brothers were at this battle. They, they followed Saul to war. In verse 16, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took his stand. For 40 days, every morning and every night, He walks out to the hill, send me a man, and let's go at it. Send me a man, and if we win, you become our subjects. If I win, you, I had that, yeah, if I win, if I win, you become our subjects. If you win, we'll become your subject. And 40 days and 40 nights, he stood and he proclaimed this. And guess what? They weren't just dismayed and terrified one day. For 40 days, they lived in a constant state of terror, not knowing what was going to happen to them. Saul and his entire army, not one of them, had courage. Not one of them had boldness. Now Jesse on the backside, knowing that his three sons are off to war and knowing what's going on, there's this, there's this giant Philistine by the name of Goliath who we're having this standoff with. He's wanting to war, but we're too scared to fight. But I got three sons on the battle line, and I, I got to make sure that my, my children are taken care of. And so he calls David over. He says, hey, I know you're tending sheep still, but I'm going to give you some food, and I want you to take the food. I want you to feed your three oldest brothers, and I want you to check on them. Just make sure that they're doing okay. Verse 23, as he was talking with them, Goliath, Philistine champion from Gath, again, he's called a champion, stepped out from his lines, and he shouts his usual defiance. But this time, there was, there was one thing that was different than the other times. This time, David heard it. David had been tending sheep. David had been, had been doing what he'd been practicing his, his harp instrument on the backside of a mountain as God was preparing him. But this time, he delivers food. And the only thing different about this time when Goliath speaks his defiance to the army of Israel is that David happened to be in attendance. And David, I can just imagine David, I can imagine him being there and what it would look like. Him hearing, what? What did he just say? David, a young boy amongst men, having a conversation with some friends or some some men that are battle tested. Here comes Goliath and they're cowering, going back to their tent and David saying, did he, did he say what I think he just said? And can you imagine everybody, you're gonna see it in just a second what happens. The Israelites, now whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. David, this, this young boy. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king, this is a conversation with David. 
The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. And David said, come again. Repeat that one more time. No taxes? Uh, y'all gotta, yeah, that's a better amen than that. My goodness gracious. And this is just like a brother. I can so see this happening. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger. It's like, what are you doing? You're going to embarrass us. This is our family name here. Can you imagine like an older brother saying this to his younger little punk kid? <laughs> get, get back. Get out of here. What are you, you're going to get yourself killed. You're going to get all of us killed. He burned with anger and he asked him, why in the world have you come down here? And then, then his brother, who has no courage to stand in front of a giant, pipes up a little cockiness right here. And he said, whom did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and you, your heart is wicked. You came down here only to watch the battle. You just came here to watch some people die. I know you. And David, David can't help but keep his mouth shut. David says, what have I done now? What, what in the world? Like, can I not even speak? Can I not talk to the people that are around me? He then turned away to someone else. <laughs> Look, shut up, brother. I ain't listening to you. I'm going to turn around. I've had enough of you. And he starts having another conversation, the same matter. He's like, okay, tell me again what's going to happen if somebody goes against that guy and kills him. And the men answered him just as before. What David said was overheard and was reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. I got a couple of more passages of scripture I'm going to read, and then we're going to kind of talk about these observations about David. Verse 32, David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. This is, this is David, a young teenage boy, talking to the king. Excuse me, king. Um, Y'all are terrified. But let me just go ahead and tell you, why, why are you losing heart on account of this Philistine? Now watch this, this is important. Your servant will go and fight him. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a, a young man, and he, he's been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul again, again, watch this phrase, your servant has been keeping his father's. He was about to give his reasons why he's qualified to go take on this giant. And he says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And there's so much in these three verses. But the first thing I think that, that we have to recognize about David, and it's twofold here, and we'll talk about the other side in just a moment, that I love about David was his humility. Dave, th think about it for a second. The posture of his heart as he approached the king. He's a teenage boy who's been anointed as the next king of Israel, can just, just think, if, if you knew you were about to be the next king, and don't get all spiritual on me right now, how quickly would that go to your head? It would. No, I would not. Mm -mm. I'd pray for everybody every day. No, you would be thinking about you, because this is what people do especially as a teenager. As a teenager, you ain't thinking about nobody but me, 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 me. Every teenager you know, it's me first. And he's anointed to be the next king. How quickly would that power go to his head? How quickly would, would that title mess with you 
And both times, this is what stood out to me, both times that David addresses King Saul, he calls himself a servant. Your servant, having already been anointed king, David, David kept his heart in the right place. And this is, this is so powerful to me. I, I can imagine David going through this line of thinking, I know that I'm anointed to be the next king of Israel, but Lord, I, I will sit here and I will serve King Saul as long as you call me to do that. I will sit here and play this instrument and bring peace to his life as long as you need me to do it. Lord, I'm not seeking a crown I'm seeking to be a servant. Oh, the beauty of a servant's heart. We got a lot of people, just in general, not necessarily Christians, who are striving for a title. We're striving for the crown, and we're not worried about being a servant. But don't miss the importance of David's humility. Don't miss the importance of the posture of his heart as he approaches the king, knowing that he's already been anointed, but he has enough humility to say, Lord, I will stay in my lane and do what you've called me to do for as long as you need me to do it. I will not rush the process. I don't want something if it's not the right timing. For a teenager, I don't know if he thought through this or not, but what wisdom it was because he wouldn't have been able to handle it if he took it then. So Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll be a servant as long as you need me to be a servant. Can I just remind us on a Wednesday night, if you don't know how to, if you don't know how to serve, God will not give you the opportunity to lead. If you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. If you can't be a servant, if the posture of your heart says, I need everybody to see, I need everybody to know, I need the, the spotlight on me, what I, what I think is so important is God says, that's not who I'm about to use. The people that I use are the people that keep a servant's heart. So what are, you, what are you striving for? What are you reaching for? Are you reaching for a title? What's amazing is how God works through a servant's heart. What's amazing is when you keep the posture of a servant, God says, now that is somebody that I can work with. That is somebody that I can elevate that is somebody that I can, I can bless with the desires of their heart because I know that they won't ruin what I put in their hand. They will steward it well because they know what it is to be a servant. David's humility, don't be busy reaching for a title when God is looking for a humble heart. The second thing that jumps out at me is this, and we'll see it in in this passage of scripture, and I've kind of already highlighted it just a little bit as we were reading the scripture, and it's David's age. Uh, this, this is mind-boggling to me that this young teenage boy, and maybe because I have a young teenage boy, that I'm just blown away at what God does through David as a young teenage boy. Watch this. Goliath Verse eight says this, stood up and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come up and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? This is, this is the language that he says, choose a man. I want a man. I want somebody that works out. I want, I, I want oh, I want somebody with a beard. I don't know, I'm trying to think of manly things. <laughs> Choose a man 
Goliath discounted David. Why? Because of his age. That was verse 8. He does it again in verse 10. He says, send me a man. I want a man. And what, look, let's jump to verse 33. Don't be ridiculous. This is Saul talking about David. So now the enemy is discounting him because of his age. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. You don't have what it takes. There's no way that you can do what you think you can do because you're a young teenage boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. So now we have the enemy discounting David because of his youth, but we have his own king discounting him because of his age. Goliath asked for a man, but he got a boy. Goliath was looking for a manly man with a deep voice and hair on his chest. And instead, he got a teenage boy that when he tried to roar, his voice cracked. <laughs> Goliath didn't get what he asked for, but he got more than he bargained for. And it's amazing what a young child, what a student can do with a servant's heart who has been anointed by God. It's amazing what a young person with a servant's heart can accomplish when God's hand is on their life. Can I just... We got 140 students probably next door going after the Lord with all of their heart tonight. When you see them, don't look at them and discount them because of their youth. Don't look at them and belittle them. When you see a student serving in the church, serving in their communities, walk up to them, high five them and say, man, I'm behind you. I got you. God's with you. Don't discount them because they're, they're just young teenage boys and girls. It's amazing what God can do. So train them, moms and dads, to have a servant's heart. Don't train them to be entitled to look for a position. You train them to have a servant's heart and watch what God will do in and through their life. Goliath didn't get what he asked for, but God gave him exactly who he needed. And he needed a young teenage boy that was anointed by God, possessing a servant's heart that did the job that no man could do. And then I got to thinking, oh, I got to hurry and let y'all go. I got to thinking, and this isn't in there. This was just kind of, I think, the Lord dealing with me. Let me just talk to the men. And I'm grateful that God will use whoever God wants to use. God will use a teenage boy if God wants to use a teenage boy. But here's my plea to all the men in the room. Let's at least give the Lord an option. Let's at least give the, the Lord a choice to make. Lead your family strong, sir. When the enemy comes... Don't you cower back in your tent like every one of those Israelite warriors. You lead strong. You stand for the things of God. You stand strong. You be willing to fight the forces of hell that are coming against your family. You, stand, you get a backbone for the things of God. God forbid that God has to choose somebody else to fight battles for my family because I don't have the courage to do it myself. Don't make your teenage boy have to go to battle for you when you don't have the courage to do it for your family. And I don't, I don't, I don't know, I, I'm just, I'm, this is not Bible for sure, but it, it got me thinking, like, I wonder if God would have used a man, had a man had the courage to say, all right, God, let's go. Okay, we gotta keep going. Verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant has been, this is his plea, like, oh, let me go, let me fight him. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. This young teenage boy, the one that all of y'all are discounting, and I struck it, and I rescued it from, the, from its mouth when it turned on me. 
He's more of a man than most people I know. I seized it by its hair and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Ooh, I like it. This is good because he has defied the armies of the living God. And here's the third thing. And then I'll let you go put your babies to bed that you have to understand about David that, that just Ah, I'm so fired up about it. Watch verse 37. The Lord, this is what he says. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Here, here's, here's the third thing that a teenage boy understood that many of us grown adults that have been serving God our whole life miss every single day. He had more confidence in his God than any one of the men combined that were about to go fight Goliath. His confidence in God as a teenage boy is through the roof. Saul said to David, all right, man, good luck. May the Lord be with you. And he sends him on his way, and Saul tried to dress him up in all of his armor David refused. I'm not using helmets and swords. I'm not doing any of that. If I'm going into this battle, I'm going into this with something that I know how to use. Can I tell you, if you're going to go into battle, if you're going to go into war, you better have some weapons that are tried and true. You better have some weapons that you know how to use. You better know how to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're going to fight some spiritual battles, don't go into a battle not knowing how to get a hold of the Lord. You got to have some weapons that you know. Ooh, when I call on the name of the Lord, he will answer me and he will deliver me. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he's going to do it. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw, oh, here it is again, that he was, he was just a little boy glowing with health and he was handsome and he despised him, and he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And if I was David, I can imagine David's humble, but he's also got a holy confidence in God. He said, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And I just picture David saying something like this. It's not the sticks you should be worried about. It's the stone right here, big boy. This is, <laughs> this is, <laughs> come here, he said. This is, this is Goliath talking to David. Come here, I'll give your flesh to the birds of the wild animals. And David said to the Phil, oh, his confidence, you can see it. It's oozing now. You come against me with the sword and the spear and the javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you, whom you have defiled, Goliath. This day, we will not wait another day. There will not be day 41. I'm not gonna sit here another day and let you walk out on your perch and defy the God of Israel. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Oh, he's got a confidence in God. This is a teenage boy. And I will strike you down. And not only will I kill you, I will cut off your head. It's graphic now. This very day, I will give the carcasses, watch, of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. Oh, it's not even about you anymore, Goliath. I have so much confidence in my God that we're about to wipe out the whole army that's coming against us. That's how good my God is. That's how much I trust him, that not only am I going to take you out, but we're going to wipe the whole crew out. And all of those gathered here, David says, will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And I just wanna ask you a question on this Wednesday night as I close. How differently would you live your life if you truly believed that God had your back? How differently would you lead your families? How different would you walk into work tomorrow? How different would you pray for that coworker that said, hey, man, I'm going through it right now. If you really believe that God had your back. 
God has your back. I just wonder if we could have a group of mature Christians who have been following Jesus for a long time. I wonder if we could have a group of adults that are in this room could have as much confidence in their God as a young teenage boy did that day with a stone in one hand and a sling in the other. I wonder what would happen in our communities and in our schools and in our workplaces if we had as much confidence in God as David did in his God. If we had confidence that God had our back, you would pray for the sick. Instead of saying, well, I mean, I don't really know what to say, so let me get sister so-and-so over here. God bless. I love this, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him. This is David's confidence in God. David didn't just stand there as the Philistine moved closer to attack. David took off and he starts running towards him. No fear, no hesitation. He runs towards the battle line to meet him. It's amazing how confidently you can move when you know that your God has your back. If you know God is with you, go after it. If you know God has your back, have a little boldness and a little confidence to say, all right, God, I know you're with me. You've never let me down and you're not gonna start today. I don't know how you're gonna do it. This seems crazy to me, but I know this is your word. And so reaching into his bag, a servant taking out a stone, a servant and a stone, he slung it and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. And the stone didn't just hit him and bounce off, it sank into his forehead. And he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. It's amazing what God can do with a servant's heart and a stone. It's amazing what God can do with a shepherd boy and a stone. It's amazing what God can do with a student and a stone. It's amazing what God can do. When you believe that God has your back and you have faith that he will do what he said he was going to do. And then David, as we close, stand with me. Verse 51, David ran over and stood over him. And for the first time now, he hadn't had a sword. He lays the sling down and he picks up the Philistine sword and he draws it from its sheath. And after he killed him, again, it's a little graphic. If you have little kids in here, cover their ears. He cut off his head with the sword. And the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, and they turned and ran. Oh, this is good. And David, David took the Philistine's head, and he brought it to Jerusalem. But he put the Philistine's weapon in his own tent. Yeah, I, I got to thinking, I wonder... Just David was kind of a big deal. David just kind of, he was kind of, he just did some things. God used him. And and here's what I wonder. This is so goofy. I wonder if David had to get a storage unit. That's what really went through my mind as I read this. Vince, I thought, did, did David had to get a storage unit by chance? I don't know how they stored things for sure, but I know you don't either. I'm sorry. I was it? But he, he took the armor and he stored it in his tent. And I, and I wonder, because he used the lion and the bear as faith to say, you know what? God did this for me there. I, I, I guarantee you David had like a, a bear claw around his neck and the tooth of a lion around it too. Like I wonder if he just stored up All of those things that reminded him of those times when God brought him through. And then the next time that he had to face something that no grown man had the courage for. 
he just went back over to his storage unit and he said, oh, I forgot when you did this, Lord. And oh my goodness, that was when I was a boy. But I remember, and he puts his armor there. Because David knows what God is calling me to do. I'm going to be the king of this land one day. I'm going to go through some things. Life's not always going to be easy. I'm going to make some mistakes, but I know that I've got to have God on my side. And when I get where God is taking me, I'm going to need this as a reminder that if he did it then, he's going to do it again. Somebody needs to have a drawer in your house, a storage unit of when God came through for you. Just a little spot where you put some memorabilia that you can open every once in a while. You can just let, oh, I forgot, Lord, you did it. And just look at it and smile and walk to work. Here we go, God, me and you. David's humility, servant's heart. David's youthfulness. Don't despise the next generation. Encourage them, empower them, lift them up, speak words of life over them. Don't hold on to what you have, pass a legacy on to the next generation. And then have a confidence in God as you walk out of here tonight. Just believe that he is who he says he is and watch what he will do. If you keep a servant's heart, watch God use you as you have confidence in him. He will use you. He will have your back. That's the kind of God that he is. Come on, would you give him a hand clap of praise all across this room tonight? Thank you, Jesus. So Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for meeting us in this room. What a joy it is to open your word. Lord, I love your word. It is so life-giving. It is so encouraging. It is so challenging all at the same time. What a, what a beautiful thing it is to open your word. God, I thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. I pray that we would walk out of here with a renewed confidence in who you are, that you've got our back no matter what. No matter what giant we face, you are with us. And if you're with us, we're going to make it. Bless us as we go our ways. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. On behalf of our pastoral team and our leadership team, we just want to thank you again for worshiping with us this morning at Christian Life Austin Online. We pray that this service remains in your heart and helps lead you to your next steps on your faith journey. And we want to take a moment right now to give you the opportunity to give your life to Jesus. If you've never made that decision before in your life, whether you're in your living room right now or you're traveling, I know that Jesus will meet you wherever you are. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you want salvation today, it is that simple. All you have to do is say with your tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord and also believe in your heart, truly believe that God raised him from the dead. Let's take a moment and let's pray together. I'm gonna pray a prayer, and maybe you wanna pray a very similar prayer to what I'm gonna pray, but let's pray together right now. God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the gift of salvation given through Jesus. We believe that Jesus is Lord, and we also believe that you, God, you raised Jesus from the dead. And God, we receive and we accept your salvation. We thank you for all you do for us. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Wow. Well, congratulations to everyone who made that decision. I'm so proud of you. And I want you to know that all of heaven is celebrating with you right now in this very moment. And we at Christian Life Austin are also celebrating with you as well. But hey, we know that this is only step one on the journey. We want you to know that you are not alone and we don't even expect for you to figure this whole thing out on your own. We wanna partner with you as we walk through our core values. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference in the lives of others. We would love to help you take your next step. Whether it's water baptism, joining a life group, or getting plugged in and serving through Growth Track, 
We have everything you need to make this process easy. And we wanna walk alongside you as you take your next step. We want you to know that you're valued here at Christian Life Austin, and you're valued in the kingdom of heaven. Hey, we wanna know what your next step is. And we wanna know if you made the decision to follow Jesus today. So please click the link in the description so we can get connected with you. Again, thank you so much for worshiping with us here today at Christian Life Austin, and we can't wait to see you soon.